Right, hi, my name's Alexander Els. I'm uh, on the observability team at Atlassian. So we run quite a few services in Go, and of course, being an observability team, we care a lot about understanding how they operate. So Go provides um, tools that make profiling really easy. And this talk is going to be about using these tools to discover what your code is doing once it reaches production. Uh, so Lasting Course is a major sponsor of GovCon AU. I'm really excited about this, that we get to sponsor it in the first year of the conference. Because um, uh, it's, it's really great to be both here as a speaker and a representative at Lassian. Uh, I'd just like to pause for a moment to, to thank the um, organisers for doing all the work that they've done. I'm reminded this is a little bit like a wedding. There's a lot of work leading up to it. It's going to go very fast on the day. You need to make sure that you take the time to enjoy it. So thanks, Katie and Chewie and everyone who's done the work there. And of course, we're hiring. So we have quite a lot of Go roles at Atlassian. We're not just a Java shop, which is what I've already had a bunch of questions about that, uh, particularly in infrastructure areas. So anywhere we're running back-end systems to kind of uh, keep the wheels turning, there's a lot of Go there. Uh, you're going to see sprinkled throughout the audience members. There are quite a lot of Atlassians here who work on different teams. So uh, just grab some aside and ask them what they're doing. Um, and come visit us at the booth, and we'll uh, talk you off about uh, what we're doing with Go. Right, so profiling Go, this is a really challenging topic, mainly because it's already been covered so well. Uh, and the best example of this is at GoForCon two months ago, Dave Cheney did this fantastic, blisteringly amazing talking about how to use Go's profiling tools. Um, which, if you look at the timeline, it's actually quite interesting because a few months back, uh, I was selected to do this talk about profiling. Dave happens to be on the selection committee. Then he goes and does this amazing talk about profiling. So I'm not saying that he's totally set me up for failure, <laughs> but the data are suggestive. Um, so where does this lead us? Well, this is actually a really good thing. You should totally go and re uh, watch Dave's talk. It's called Two Go Programs, Three Different Pro Profiling Techniques. Um, it's, it'll take you through using the profile and trace tools, uh, and you'll get a really thorough understanding how they work. And that leaves me to focus on the bit about doing it in production, which is what I care about. As I said, I'm on the observability team. I deal a lot with infrastructure stuff. What I really care about is what happens once we uh, deploy that code. So I'd like to sell you on two ideas. The first is that profiling Go programs is really useful and worthwhile. And the second is that profiling your production services is safe and easy if you plan ahead. So there'll be two parts to this talk. The first part is I'm going to go through my experiences of using PProf to uh, diagnose a production issue, where we'll identify and fix a specific performance problem we had. And we'll go through a little bit of what I learned about Go from this experience and see what we can discover there. And the second bit is my recommendations for setting, setting yourself up for success uh, using the Go's profiling tools. So this is why you might, might want to profile your production services and how you should prepare to do it. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a story. The story begins with a screaming fan and an uncomfortably hot laptop. I'm working on a feature for Pollinator, which is one of our monitoring tools at Atlassian, and things have become unexpectedly warm. I reflexively run top, and I see that Pollinator is burning CPU. Now, 500% CPU is really strange because, as you can imagine, working on my laptop, this isn't doing much. But I go to our production dashboards, and I see much the same thing. Now, it might be a little bit difficult to read the numbers up there, but what this is showing is that all our pollinator instances are hovering at about 98% CPU. So something's wrong. We can deviate a little bit and just give you a little bit of context about what this system actually does. So pollinator is a monitoring tool for alerting teams when their service is down. It provides a bunch of features around doing basic sort of HTTP ping type checks, as well as providing JavaScript and Python scripted environments to do run code um, against your services, and even Selenium browser tests. So the majority of what Polite is doing here is it's nearly all network. So high, high CPU is actually really unexpected for what we're doing with it. Great, where do we start? Well. I know that when I start investigating production issues, the first step is usually uh, to seek the wisdom of popular culture. So to that end, I've gone to the wise words of Midnight Oil, who posed two interesting questions. How can we dance when our CPU fan is turning, and how can we sleep when our CPU cores are burning? Uh, I'm, I'm fairly sure those are the lyrics. You don't need to fact check me on that. Um, so with that in mind, next I go to our production dashboards. 
Right, so again, I mentioned that we're an observability team. We've spent a lot of time instrumenting applications to actually understand what's going on in the internals. And so looking at our dashboards, as I did at the time, um, we have plenty of signals telling us that everything is okay. The only thing we're seeing is high CPU. All our other important measures, things like the number of checks we're executing, the success rates, and all that kind of stuff, uh, indicates that everything's pretty normal. Um, which means it's really strange. So we have some kind of um, uh, performance degradation. It's non-impacting, and we don't really have any signals that are telling us what to do. Where do we go next? Well, fortunately, we can go to Go's profiling tools. Um, so now's the bit where we're going to do the live demo, which uh, always goes smoothly, as we know. And I'm going to take you through how I use the profiling tools to help me solve this particular CPU usage bug. And we'll see what else we can learn at the same time. OK, the first thing I do is I'm going to bring this little CPU monitor thing up here. Um, so this being a CPU usage bug, we're hopefully going to see a big spike in this number when I start running things. I'll be running things with Docker Compose today because we have a bunch of dependencies that just makes things pretty, pretty easy. All right, OK, so 492% CPU. That, that seems, seems not ideal. Um, great, so we've got a broken application here. First, we're going to go and get a profile. So to do this, I have uh, the uh, pprof endpoints exposed under this admin pprof URL. I'm just going to grab a five-second profile and save it to a local file. And what this is doing is 100 times a second, uh, the runtime stops what it's doing, goes and has a look at the stacks of, all, of the uh, Go routines, and then saves this so later we can do some analysis on it. And then we'll use Go tool pprof to spin up an HTTP server exposing this for us. OK. So the first view it takes us into is the graph view. Now, this is really good for understanding the structure of the code. Um, so to give you an idea, we can see that the larger boxes are where there's more time spent in CPU. And if we sort of drag down here, we can see there's a bunch of kind of runtime stuff going down the bottom. And we've got some big boxes saying things like sync.mutex and where are we? Runtime select go and stuff like that. Um, because we're pretty sure that this is going to be a bug in application code, not the standard library or the runtime, we're going to start there. Um, and so what we can see is the bits at the top here that are interesting. We've got this thing called alert handler and this other thing called result handler. So when I describe what Pollinator does, it basically has a bunch of parts. There's a scheduler which goes and figures out when checks should be executed. It sends those off to a bunch of Polar Go routines who go in and execute those checks. Those turn into some results, which can send off to a channel to some result handlers. Again, a bunch of Go routines. If there are any alerts that are triggered out of that due to the state of those results, then those get sent over another channel to some uh, alert handler routines. So it's really straightforward. Um, and there are two places we're looking at here, the result handler and the alert handler. And below each of these, we can see that uh, below the alert handler, we've got a bunch of time spent in runtime select Go. Uh, so the select go is the implementation of the select statement in go. And we can see there's also some time spent in a cancel context done. And there's a bunch of mutexes under that. Right, so we're going to come back to these. First, we're going to have a look at the flame graph view. So this gives us a better picture of where time is spent. So we can see the horizontal axis is, is where we're spending our time. And the vertical axis is the call graph, so how deep we're going. Um, our application code entry point, we've got this thing called panic logger. That doesn't do much. All it is is captures panic, so there's not actually time spent there itself. Everything's going to be in these alert handler and result handlers. So we're going to focus on the alert handler for now. We can see most of the time here is being spent in this select go function. Um, that's a bit strange. So we, we imagine that select as like a, a basic statement in go is, is going to be you know, fairly performant. So we're already got the feeling that we're probably doing something wrong there. Um, and we can see that most of the time spent in locking operations, which is also interesting. The other amount of time is mostly being spent in this cancel context.done method, uh, which again, we're using a bunch of, hitting a bunch of lock and unlock methods. 
Right, so we've got a pretty, idea, pretty good idea where we're spending time. Uh, we want to understand why. So I'm going to go back to our graph view again for a moment. And I'm going to select the alert handler here. And just go to view, source. And this is not ideal, but let's see. This is the one view where it goes and makes everything gray and hard to see. So I'm going to do some CSS wizardry here by changing AAAA to 333. And that concludes the live demo. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> right, okay, so we've got this alert handler here. And this gives us a great breakdown line by line in the source code of where we're spending time. This is incredibly useful. So we can see on the left-hand side of the column here, we've got the, the line numbers. Uh, the third column over here, this is the one I'm most interested in here. So it's saying that we're spending 2.84 seconds in this go routine. Now, you remember at the start, I said that we're sampling 100 times a second. So that means that each individual sample point is uh, 10 milliseconds. So what it's saying here, 2.84 seconds, is actually 284 samples it's seen at that time where we're in this function. So let's go through and we'll have a look down through this function. We can see that we're spending a whole heap of time on this line doing select. And if we go a bit further, there's not much going on until we get down here and we spend a lot of time in this context.done line. Okay. So again, I said before that we expect to select is probably going to be pretty quick. Um, it would seem strange if context.done was also not very quick, given that it's so ubiquitous in Go code everywhere. Um, so what's going on? All right. Let's go and have a look at actually the code and step through and find out what it's actually doing. We can see at the start uh, we're deferring this done call, which we don't need to care about for now. That's not actually doing anything. We create a ticker that fires once per second, and then we enter this for loop. So this is the main um, alert, uh, main event loop for the alert handler. Inside this for loop, we have our select where we're spending a lot of time, and we have two cases. We wait for that ticker to fire once per second, and we might handle some retries of notifications we weren't able to send the first time. And we try and read off the alert queue. So if there's any new alerts we need to process, then we want to process them. If neither of those things happens, then we enter this default case where we have another select, and we're selecting on context.done. So the intent here is that if we have any work to do in uh, sending new alerts or resending alerts that didn't work the first time, we should do that. Otherwise, maybe we'll leave early. So the idea is that we, if, we, if we have work that we've already decided that alerts that should be fired, it'd be a good idea to clear those out of the queue before we terminate. What's actually happening, though, is if we don't have a ticker firing and we don't have anything coming on the alert queue and we're not in your context, then we're hitting these two default cases, which means the only time we're spending CPU is, on, is, is in the select uh, statement and evaluating context.done. So let's go and do a really trivial fix to this problem. We have our alert handler code here. And we're simply going to do the most cheesy thing possible, which is a time.sleep. Time to millisecond. I said we come back to result handler. I happen to know that it's basically doing the same thing, same kind of event loop. So we're going to put the same fix in here. Fix. Right, and now if we cancel this, we need to keep our CPU monitor up there so we can see what's going on. Uh, and we'll run it again. Okay. And wait for the dust to settle. Right, okay, so, C so CPU has dropped a lot. So we've got some other stuff going on in these Docker containers. It's not just pollinator, but basically that's, that's fixed the immediate impact of this problem. Then we can go and figure out what to do later on to, to sort it out properly. Um, right, so we fixed the problem. Let's move on and see what else we can learn about this. So when we had a look here at the graph view, we saw that there was some different behavior between the result handler and the alert handler. 
The alert handler is spending a lot of time in this select go, result handler is not, and they're both spending a bit of time in context. But these, these bits of code are basically doing the same thing. So I already stepped you through the alert handler code here where we're selecting on a couple of channels. We have a default case, which we do a select on a context, and otherwise we kind of go back to the start. Result handler is very, very similar. We have a for loop, we have a select. We're trying to select on a single channel this time. Then we have a default case, a select on a context, and then another default case which doesn't do anything. So why are we seeing different performance there? Well, under select go, we can see we're spending a lot of time in this select lock function, and there's also a select unlock function. If we have a look at the source code for select, this is a select lock function here. So when you do a select, it has all these different cases that you specified. It goes and needs to grab a lock on those to do anything. Okay, fair enough. What's different between these two situations is, if you dig into the details, this line says, and apologies to those people who don't like reading what I've got highlighted on the slide, <laughs> the compiler rewrite, rewrites selects that statically have only zero or one cases plus default into simpler constructs. So the alert handler has two cases in its select, the result handler has one. Could that be the cause of it? Well, to test this out, we can reintroduce our time.sleep bug. Okay. And what if we just add an additional channel? So we'll add another case in here. Um, so we know this thing's never going to fire, we're just going to put it in there as another um, thing to look at. We'll rebuild our Docker image and run it again. Okay, so again, we can see from the CPU usage here that we've reintroduced our, our CPU bug. If we go and grab another profile, we'll have a look and see what's different this time. And, oh, we've got a result handle. Where's the alert handle gone? Oh, live demos, they never go wrong. What's happened here? I didn't save. Oh. <laughs> I wasn't made aware that you have to save your code. That wasn't in there. This is the best kind of audience participation where they fix your problems for you. I love it. Okay. Where pair is arbitrarily large, yeah. <laughs> okay, right, so do we have our bug again? We do, looks good. Okay, let's go and grab another profile. Hey, okay, so now we have um, our result handler and alert handler both spending a lot of time in this select. Okay, so we had this magic case in select that was actually in, in sort of improving things um, for us in the, in the case where we only had one channel we were trying to pull off. So that's the first mystery solved. We have one more mystery. That was why are we spending so much time in locks in context.done? So to answer that, we will have a look at the code for context. So it was specifically a cancel, cancel context.done. And this is what it's doing. The first, when you call it, it first grabs a lock. It sees whether it's already created a done channel. If not, then it creates it, unlocks and returns the channel to you. So this mutex is here purely so that the first, on the first call, it makes a channel and we're always returning that one. Um, does that mean we can avoid the cost of this mutex if we call done once and it just keeps the result? Well, if we have a look at the interface definition for a context, you can see that done returns a channel that's closed when work done on behalf of this context should be cancelled. 
done may return nil if this context can never be cancelled, and successive calls to done return the same value. Great, so the specification for, for context says that we're allowed to keep the first result. What if we go and do that? Again, we'll go back to our code. We're going to get rid of our dummy channel this time. I'll do it over here first. I don't want to forget to do this. Someone remind me to save. Okay. Right. So we'll call it done channel. Equals ctx.done. Easy peasy. And we're going to make this done channel here. Oops. Save. Okay. And we're doing the same thing in the other function. Okay, so I definitely press save twice, so it's going to work for sure. And again, we'll rebuild. And we'll run it again. What's going to happen? Ah. Now we're consuming even more CPU than before. <laughs> so what we've actually done by, by keeping the first call to that context.done function around, instead of calling it again and hitting that mutex every time, we've actually reduced lock contention, which has allowed us to speed up and burn even more CPU. <laughs> this is amazing. So this doesn't help us in this particular case, but it's really interesting to understand um, the, the performance impact of using some of the, the features of, of Go. Um, I don't know a case in which you would need to hit context on done a lot, but if you did find such a case, then now we know that there might be some value to saving that first result rather than calling the function over and over. So that's our second mystery solve. Okay. And here's the, the, uh, the impact of putting that change at the change out, just putting a time.sleep in. So we've gone from like 98% CPU down to, what's that, probably around 10 to 15% or something like that. Um, you can see where the old stack drops off and the new stack comes online, they run in parallel for about an hour. Um, yeah, so that was the, that was, this was actually a real problem and the real workaround to, to get us past that, that um, period of eating CPU. So what I've shown so far is that profiling your Go code is really useful and it's easy to do. So the next step is that you need to make it easy to do in production. So I'm going to ask a question here and you can all feel free to be honest because this is a safe place. Who tests their code in production? Oh, there's a few hands. Cool. Brave souls. Thank you. All right, everyone tests their code in production. Who are you kidding? You might have unit tests, you've probably got integration tests. Uh, I'm sure you're doing some benchmarks, you're doing load tests. Um, you might even be doing stuff like fuzzing and static analysis and all that great kind of stuff. What you don't have is a production environment until your code hits production. What's different? You might be working on a different OS. Maybe you're developing on, on uh, a Mac and you're deploying to Linux. There's probably different hardware involved, different software involved bet between your, your staging and your prod environments. Uh, your configuration's gonna be different. You're gonna have different dependencies. They're also gonna have their own different configuration. Um, the workload's gonna be different. That's not just the volume, but also the shape of the work. And you're gonna have different users. And users do all sorts of crazy and wonderful things that, that um, that help us discover how services really run. You can't test for these things. You can, you can discover them and then replicate the test, but sometimes these are lessons that you have to learn first in production. So you cannot replicate your production if you cannot replicate your production issues. Let me ask the same question again. Who tests their code in production? <laughs> oh, I see more hands, okay, good. I, I've convinced a few people, great. Right, so you've decided to profile in production. Uh, what's next? Well, 
there's two things I think you need to do. You need to make it easy and you need to make it safe. So here are a set of recommendations that, that I've found uh, uh, useful. So the first is that don't use HTTP to default serve marks for anything. Okay, it magically exposes things you don't know about. Um, there are people on the internet who are exposing PPROF endpoints and they don't even realize it. Anything can register out. This is a public variable in the net HTTP package. Anything can go and create its own handle on sitting on that. Um, that means not just your code, but also the libraries you import and the libraries they import. You, you just can't trust it, in my opinion. So instead, start with a clean mux and server, import net HTTP preprof, and expose what you need. Or use middleware to do the lifting. So in this case, I've put a link here to GoChi. It goes and sets up all the endpoints. You can just copy paste that code to your heart's content. Make it private. Because these profiling tools reveal a lot about your code and the internal state of your systems, um, you really want to keep them private. So it's also an increased surface area um, for security, security vulnerabilities. Thanks. Um, so yeah, it should be pretty much a no-brainer that you don't want other people to get to this who shouldn't have access. So instead, restrict access. Put your PPROF endpoints behind authentication, uh, or maybe run it on a non-public IP import, um, or don't expose it by HTTP. Instead, you could have it respond to a signal. Send it a kill signal, it makes it go and drop a profile file to disk or something. You should assess the performance impact. So there's a small performance impact in my experience, but it's not zero. Um, it might be neg negligible in my case, but what about yours? Maybe your workload is different. So instead, look at the perfect impact under controlled conditions. And do this so that you can gain confidence that you can use this tool when you need it. You need to make this convenient. People don't like cumbersome tools and processes. Uh, more than one command is too much. Instead, make it simple. A single curl with authentication, uh, or maybe you can use something like AWS SSM, which lets you remotely run commands, or Ansible or something like that, if that's what you use in your stack. You can even do chat offs. So you could have a Slack bot that you can ask it to go and fetch a profile for you and drop it in a channel. Those would all be great. They're all simple. Do something once. And you need to build the muscle memory around using these tools. They're only useful if you can use them when you need to. So you don't want to read Stack Overflow at 3 a.m. to figure out how to run Go's profiling tools. That's, that's not going to keep you sane. So instead, regularly use your tools. It's a dress rehearsal for the real thing. Use your alerts and incident runbooks to tell you what to do. So when my team creates alerts for things, we have sufficient information in the alert to tell us what it's about and where to go for more help on diagnosing it. So those things we call runbooks. So in our runbooks, we have information about how to run our profiling tools. So you don't have to remember, you don't have to guess at 3 a.m. It's there for you. Even if the only thing you want to do is grab a capture of the profile under adverse conditions so you can look at the next day, that information's there. And do it the same way across all your systems. So there are a bunch of different ways you could expose this profiling, uh, as I mentioned. Make it easy for yourself, just do it the same way everywhere. Right, so to recap, um, we started with a problem that we couldn't explain using our existing monitoring. We used the PPROF to identify where the bug was and use that information to fix it. Then along the way, we discovered some interesting stuff about select and context. Finally, I've given you some suggestions of things to consider to make sure that you can also have a good time profiling your Go services in production. Thanks very much. Thank you.